Okay. So we're here to discuss administration of the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, but I always like to start with a few minutes on the public health story behind its use and and why it's a, a good thing. You know, suicide is a, a major public health crisis, one of the world's greatest public health epidemics, a leading cause of death across the world, across ages. Dr. Insel, the head of NIMH, calls it the under-recognized public health crisis of suicide. Now, the good news is it's a preventable public health problem, but we need to do better in a few areas, starting with this one. College students' second leading cause of death, although less than 20% of college students who die by suicide received any campus-based services. In the military, suicide is the second most common cause of death. Suicide in the military actually accounts for 20% of all of suicides each year. Did you know that suicide in the National Guard actually doubled in 2010? And in, in high schoolers, non-depressed high schoolers, so suicide, uh, behavior and ideation, incredibly common. When CDC does studies in just any regular high schooler population, 10% approximately say they've attempted suicide in the past year, 10%, and many more have seriously thought about it. And it comes with a huge public health burden, Attempters actually constitute a high proportion of all emergency referrals to psychiatric services and subsequently command a disproportionate level of resources. Did you know that the World Health Organization estimates in a few years depression is going to be the second most debilitating disease in the world, second only to heart disease? Just a, a, an extraordinary scope of, of, of the issue. And unf we also know that 90% of individuals who die by suicide have an untreated mental illness, 60% of which is depression. So when I had the great fortune to give a speech to the leaders of the European Union on how to fight depression and suicide, I said, you can put up barriers and bridges and do all these other things, but if you want to maximize impact, it's about treatment and identification. Unfortunately, however, most people who need treatment don't get it. Approximately 50 to 75% of those in need get no treatment or inadequate treatment. We also know that prevention depends upon appropriate identification and screening. However, medicine and even psychiatry has been challenged by a lack of clarity as to how to define suicidal occurrences. And corresponding to that, we have had no well-defined terminology, which very much cuts across research and clinical settings across the world. So what happens is the same occurrence or adverse event gets called 16 different things. Suicide attempt, not a suicide attempt, threat, gesture. And often the labels are negative, like manipulative, non-serious, but actually based on incorrect notions as to the relationship between seriousness and lethality. So somebody hears, oh, she only took three pills, we can't call that suicidal when the data actually tells us something else. This will clearly have negative implications on how we manage. If we can't properly identify suicidal ideation and behavior, we certainly can't understand, manage, or treat it, no matter where we're trying to do so. Now, this problem has had profound impact on all our medication safety questions, which was how FDA got, got to us in the first place. But it even limits our confidence in epidemiological statistics, right? Because if everybody's defining things differently, how can we compare across counties, states, countries? Now, the good news is the new CDC surveillance definitions are the Columbia definitions, and there's a link to the CSSRS and the new CDC document. So we're making progress, but this problem has had its tentacles in lots of different places. So what ends up happening is we can't interpret the meaning of suicidal occurrences, which hampers precise communication on an individual or a population basis. So things that should be called suicidal are missed and things are inappropriately called suicidal.
Same things in, in same thing in clinical trials. We can't interpret what we're needing to make sense of. Adverse events that should be called suicidal are missed and, and vice versa. And this was the problem that the regulators faced when they were first trying to make get it answers to this very important question. This is a slide from the inst- uh, quote from the Institute of Medicine highlighting this very problem as one of the major impediments to suicide prevention efforts in general. Now, these are examples of the problem, and they come from our work with with FDA across many medication areas, but it reflects what goes on in practice, uh, you know, across the world. So the first one says, patient attempted to hang himself with a rope. Investigator did not consider this a serious adverse event, but rather part of the disorder. So you see, suicidal anything wasn't indicated in that label. The overdose was, in fact, intentional, yet called accidental overdose. However, if you look at this one on the top, we call this one the slap heard round the world because it's been written a lot about. In fact, this scale and this issue was the lead article of the New York Times about three years ago because suicide assessment has become such a big issue. And this example was in there because it really tells the story. Somebody somewhere called a slap in the face a suicide attempt. Now, clearly a slap in the face shouldn't be called a suicide attempt. What it shows you, it's not about drug companies or investigators or doctors or nurses covering things up because it shouldn't be called that. It's about the fact that there's been no training or standardization in the field in how to do this. Here's a similar one on the bottom. Um, This was a schizophrenic. Hit his head on the wall. Patient explained it was like my thoughts were about to explode. Inappropriately called suicide attempt. And my final example would be funny if it weren't tragic. The patient involved in the Federal Witness Protection Program I always say I'm not sure how you get in a drug company trial when you're in the Federal Witness Protection Program, but this is, in fact, a true case. For having testified against mobsters, died by apparent suicide, he called the lawyer, not the doctor, and said, please help, I'm going to die, and showed up dead, and it was labeled you know, that way. So reason to question labels. That's the problem. What happens when we start to do something about it? Well, when we first applied a standardized approach, it led to a 50% reduction in identified suicide attempts, a 50% reduction in that harm ratio, which shows you why we needed to do better, and it resulted in lower risk estimates. And that's consistent with findings that misclassification can actually lead to overestimation of true risk, which is not a good thing. But even that's not enough. Doing something standardized is not enough. And what I mean by that is... Previous research and clinical practice have not been designed to answer the questions we need answered. They have, they have not been designed to adequately assess for suicidal ideation and behavior. So, for example, the FDA work with risk, the risks of uh, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, et cetera, we were making the best sense of limited information. Those studies were not designed to answer questions about suicidal issues. And more specifically, we had to rely on what we call spontaneously generated adverse events. The problem with doing that when you're looking for a causal answer is that people on active medications have more side effects, right? Headache, stomach ache, whatever it may be. It may just be that somebody had more contact with an investigator because they had more side effects and therefore more time to hear about suicidal occurrences, as opposed to it being a true difference in risk. So in other words, those findings may really just be about the limitations of the data. And we have a number of data sets that that really support that. When we systematically monitor, it does not confirm the risk we saw with adverse events. So the first thing we're doing here in a clinical trial or in practice is avoiding false or misleading results. Furthermore, we can expect to see suicidal ideation and behavior across all medical disorders, not just psychiatric illness. 25% across general medical disorders will have ideation. Almost 9% will have made an attempt. So we know that we need to get it right. So here we come to the, to the CSSRS, which is we, we think what addresses the problem. 
Now, the, the, the scale has become the prospective counterpart of our FDA work. So people think we actually created it for FDA, but it's actually the opposite. It, it came first. It, it started, it was developed many years before that in the first nationally funded um, NIMH treatment of adolescent suicide attempter study. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in that age group, but this was the first large intervention trial to look at how to help them. And in that national trial, we had every scale for depression and suicide, and the experts said, there's nothing to do this. There's nothing to track severity or density or change or put ideation and behavior together. So we created it in the context of this national trial to fill this gaping hole in the field that had not been filled before. And that's actually how FDA got to us in the first place. And in fact, um, in, according to the FDA guidance, so what we call, we say CCASA is retrospective CSSRS. CCASA was designed just when you only have the limitations of adverse events. And in the FDA guidance, when CSSRS is used, they're very clear that CCASA should not be done and does not need to be done. So it was developed by many leading experts. It's actually a collaboration with Beck's group. Um, you're probably familiar with their suicide and depression scales. It's evidence-based, and it's very low burden. A typical administration time is just a, just a minute or two. But it uniquely assesses both behavior and ideation. So we got together as authors, and we said, what's the minimum amount of information we'd want to track in any setting, whether it's a school, a medical ED, or a clinical trial? And it's simply a one to five rating for suicidal ideation of increasing severity from a wish to die through an active thought of killing oneself with plan and intent. It can be as little as two questions for ideation. So you say, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? If the answer is no to both of those questions, there is no ideation. So you move on to behavior. Those are the two screen questions for ideation. Behavior fixes the problems we've seen in the past. First of all, it covers the full range of behavior. It used to be that only a suicide attempt was asked about, and then you would miss the person that bought the gun yesterday or put the noose around their neck, things you cannot afford to actually miss. It also is the first thing that has definitions, and we saw that quote from Institute of Medicine, how important definitions are. And standardized questions for each category to guide the interviewer to the easiest and most improved identification. Every single thing, item on this scale, is there because it says something important about risk. We need to assess these things. If you just take one, one of our three other behaviors, preparatory behaviors, that's collecting or buying pills, purchasing a gun, writing a will or suicide note, um, Aaron Beck and Greg Brown did an analysis for us. And if somebody had that just that one behavior, they were eight to 10 times more likely to end their life. So everything is there because it actually needs to be assessed. And what's interesting, again, we used to just ask about attempts. But what we're seeing is that these other behaviors are incredibly common. So in our electronic CSSRS, that's a self-report electronic version um, where it's been administered to 35,000 patients, mostly depressed patients, um, of all of those patients in a short-term clinical trial, most of the people had nothing. But of the people that actually had behaviors, only 70 were actual attempts and almost 500 were a combination of these other three, aborted, preparatory, and interrupted. These are things we weren't asking about before. So it's what we call semi-structured. That means it's a flexible format. The questions are provided as helpful tools. It's not required to ask any or all of them just enough to get the right answer. The most important thing is for you to gather enough information to decide if you should call something suicidal or not. So for example, if you say, have you made a suicide attempt? And the person says, yes, I took 50 pills because I definitely wanted to die. Well, you'll see in a few moments that you have enough information to call that a suicide attempt, and you do not need to ask additional or unnecessary questions. 
sources of information. This is very important. With questionnaires like this, you're encouraged to use any and all sources of information that inform your best answer. So typically, the patient or the subject or the person is going to give you the best insight into their suicidal feelings. But that's not always the case. Let's say you're, you're following a subject or a patient and their spouse calls you up and tells you that, you know, your subject is in the ICU in Virginia, and this is what they wrote in the suicide note, well, you'll have enough information according to the other source of information to indicate suicide attempt on the form, and you don't necessarily even need to speak to the subject directly. Clearly, in the case of suicides, you're going to use records, etc. Okay, so this is the range of types of ideation. And what this is doing is articulating what we've been trained in psychiatry to do for many years. It just hasn't necessarily been spelled out like this. Again, beginning with a wish to die. Have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Again, no to both of those questions. There is no ideation, so you move on to behavior. However, if it's yes to the second question, have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Then you ask three, four, and five. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Or have you started to work out or worked out the details of how to kill yourself? You can't have a method intent or plan an intent if you don't have a thought of killing yourself. Those are subcategories of it. That's why only if two is yes, do you answer three, four, and five. Now, you see on the bottom, it says auditory halluc hallucinations count as ideation, qualify as ideation. People always say if it was in the context of a, of a voice or a command hallucination, does that count? Well, it, it absolutely does. So in our definitions, and when I say our um, NIMH and Beck's group in Columbia, we have a working group on definitions. And auditory hallucinations is part of the definition of suicidal ideation, as long as the content is clearly suicidal. So... Once you determine if there is any ideation, you ask a few follow-up questions only about the most severe type of ideation, and that's the highest that they endorse from one to five. Clearly, a four is more severe than a two. So if there is a thought about the most severe, you're going to go through these other questions. We're going to go through the questions, but the reason they're there is because Beck's group went through their suicide data, and these were the areas that were predictive of suicide. Again, the minimum amount of information we think that need, needs to be tracked in, in any setting. So if there is a thought about the most severe, you say, how many times have you had these thoughts? When you have the thoughts, how long do they last? Can you stop thinking about killing yourself or wanting to die if you want to? Are there things, anyone or anything like family, religion, pain of death that stopped you from wanting to die or acting on thoughts of committing suicide? And finally, what sorts of reasons did you have for thinking about wanting to die or killing yourself? Was it to end the pain or stop the way you were feeling? In other words, you couldn't go on living with this pain or how you were feeling. Or was it to get attention, revenge, or reaction from others, or both? And we know if somebody says it was to stop or end the pain, that's more serious than otherwise. So if they have more frequency, longer duration, less control, fewer deterrence, and it's to stop or end the pain, that's when we worry more. And that guides your, your clinical judgment and monitoring. The other thing we have that is, is it very clearly guides your clinical management is in terms of types of ideation. We have operationalized criteria for next steps, specific parameters for triggering referrals or next steps. And specifically, what it is, is a four or five. When you have a four or five is when you know you need to go to the next step. And the difference between a three and a four is a three is I thought about, I was having thoughts that I could jump off a bridge or take pills, but I'd never do anything about it. When you get to a four or five, a four is I'm having these thoughts. I can't tell you if I'm, if I'm going to do something about it. So there's some indication of intent. 
And this is an example of how it's used in clinical trials. So this is required for obesity trials, and this is an FDA document that shows how it's used in that way. When you have a four or five is when you trigger referral to a mental health professional. So it's really streamlining study conduct to avoid unnecessary exclusions, et cetera. And this is the same way that it's used in practice. And it's actually a research-supported threshold. So this is when uh, Dr. Greg Brown, uh, Aaron Beck's um, co-PI, co when he won the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, he showed this slide. And you see, when you get to a four or five, those bars double. And even more directly, um, we have a paper in American Journal of Psychiatry that uh, came out online and will be the December 2011 issue that showed prediction for the first time in, in, in many, many, many years, for as long as we can remember. And the four and fives were predictively supported. So the fours and fives were more predictive of somebody having a, an attempt or a behavior over the year uh, follow-up in the national trial. And it predicted, and the Beck scale of suicidal ideation did not. And this was further confirmed by the electronic um, self-report CSSRS. So of those 35,000 people, the fours and fives were predictive of a behavior. Having a behavior was also predictive. And if you had both, it was many more times uh, predict as predictive. So the precision with which we're doing this really is increasing all the time. And what's happening is this threshold is decreasing a tremendous amount of unnecessary burden because it used to be in the past that people didn't know what to manage. So they'd hear a wish to die and they'd unnecessarily walk to an ER, put on one-to-one, -one, exclude from a study. And this is the first kind of hard data showing that that's what it's doing, redirecting scarce resources to where they need to go. So this is from um, Reading Hospital in Pennsylvania. It's the first, first large hospital system that used it for the JACO requirement. And actually, it's, it's going or went on the JACO best practices list. But since they implemented the CSSRS, if you look at the bars on the, uh, on the right, their one-to-ones declined steadily over the next quarters. So again, their report is the same thing as schools or prisons, identifying the people we need to get to for the first time while avoiding the unnecessary cost and burden of, of, of these kind of things. So we're moving on to behavior. And the behavior section is driven by this definition of suicide attempt, which is really agreed upon by suicidologists across the world and, and supported by, you know, 75 NIH trials and, and 20 years of work. And the definition is a self-injurious act committed with at least some intent to die as a result of the act. First of all, it says self-injurious act. It doesn't say self-injury. There does not have to be any injury or harm just the potential for it. So if a man puts a gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger and luckily the gun failed to fire, even though he wasn't hurt, as soon as he pulled that trigger, that became a suicide attempt. There does not have to be physical harm, and that's one of the misunderstandings in the field. And then importantly, it says with at least some intent to die. When people are feeling suicidal, they often have mixed motives. It just has to be that any part of them was doing this to end their life for us to call it a suicide attempt. So if 2% of them wanted to end their life and 98% wanted to make their girlfriend or their mother angry, that's what it gets called. And it used to be that a person would say, did you want to kill yourself? The answer would be no, they'd move on. Very often with that second question, did any part of you want to kill yourself, you get a very different answer. Again, more precise identification. And then also importantly, it says as a result of the act. That means the behavior and the intent must be connected. It must be the why, at least in part. You know, sometimes people cut because they're self-mutilating and they just want to feel better. And they always have a background suicidal thought. Those two things do not equal a suicide attempt. It must be the why. And finally, we can infer intent clinically. One way we can do that is if they deny intent, but they thought what they did could have killed them. Another way is what we call clinically impressive circumstances. 
that's a highly lethal act where no other intent but suicide can be inferred, like trying to shoot oneself in the head or jumping from a ninth story or setting herself on fire or taking 200 pills. No matter what they say, you can't infer anything but suicidal intent. The other important thing to note about what we call suicide attempts is as soon as the first pill is swallowed or the first scratch with a knife is made, even if they change their mind one second later and you know logically it couldn't have hurt them, it doesn't matter. As soon as that pill has been swallowed or that scratch has been made, it's already become what we call a suicide attempt. Now, remember I said you don't have to ask any or all questions, just what you need. Sometimes It may be that somebody doesn't even realize something should be called a suicide attempt. So if you ask that first, first question, have you made a suicide attempt, and they say no, then you need to ask the second question. Have you done anything to harm yourself so you know whether there's something you need to assess? And what we're doing is distinguishing suicide attempts from non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. That's when they engage in the behavior purely 100% for reasons other than to end one's life. What we think of as self-mutilation, that's to relieve pain, internal pain, feel better, feel something, or what we call affecting external circumstances. That's like if a man goes up to the roof because he believes people will feel sorry for him if they think he's suicidal. He actually has no intention of ending his life. He just wants to get sympathy from others. Well, even if that man accidentally fell to his death, That's just what we would call it, an accidental death, theoretically, because there was no suicidal intent associated with it. So we're going to go through some cases now. Um, These are real cases from from our hospital. And the first one says, the patient wanted to escape from her mother's home. She researched lethal doses of ibuprofen. She took six ibuprofen pills and said she felt certain from her research that this amount was not enough to kill her. She stated she did not want to die only to escape from her mother's home. She was taken to the ER where her stomach was pumped and she was admitted to a psychiatric ward. Do you think we should call that a suicide attempt? Yes or no? Anybody? No. I said no. Exactly. This is not, should not be called a suicide attempt. And there are a few important things to note about this case. All over this girl's record, it said suicide attempt. And this was a psychotic adolescent on our children's day unit. And it wasn't until somebody took the time to ask the question, why? Why did you do it? One little question that we got better, more reliable information. And we think that will always be the case. The other thing is she also had suicide attempts. And she was very able to say, on these occasions, I wanted to kill myself, but here I didn't. And the point is you have to assess each occurrence independently and not assume if one thing was suicidal that the next thing will be because they come together in the same people. And it's very important for your outcomes or your risk assessment to know the difference between three suicide attempts and one. You know, multiple attempters are more at risk than single attempters. Young woman following a fight with her boyfriend felt like she wanted to die, impulsively took a kitchen knife and made a superficial scratch to her wrist, Before she actually punctured the skin or bled, however, she changed her mind and stopped. Is that an attempt? Yes. Exactly. As soon as that scratch was made. Patient was feeling ignored. She went into the family kitchen where her mother and sister were talking. She took a knife out of the drawer and made a cut in her arm. She denied she wanted to die at all, not even a little, but just wanted them to pay attention to her. How about that? Yes or no? No, exactly right. That would be the non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Patient cut her wrist after an argument with her boyfriend. Any thoughts about that? Not enough information. Exactly. Not enough information. We know what she did. We just don't know why she did it. And both self-mutilation and suicidal behavior have stressors that precipitate them. So argument with boyfriend doesn't tell you anything. Had a big fight with her ex-husband, took 15 to 20 amipramine, went to, went to the hospital, drank charcoal, unable to verbalize clear intent, but state she was well aware of the dangers of TCA overdose and the potential for death. How about that? Is that an attempt? Yes. Exactly. You can infer it if they thought it could have killed them.
Now, there's some other suicidal behaviors that are also important to assess. They just don't reach the threshold of an attempt. And the first one is called an interrupted attempt. That's when a person starts to take steps to end their life, but someone or something stops them. So they are on the ledge poised to jump. Somebody grabs them back. She has a gun in her hand. Somebody grabs it out of her hand. An aborted attempt is exactly the same thing, but they stop themselves. So he goes up to the roof. He turns around and changes his mind. She has a gun in her hand. She puts it down. He plans to drive his car off the road at high speed. On the way to the destination, he changes his mind and returns home. So the question is, has there been a time when you started to do something to end your life, but you stopped yourself before you actually did anything? And the final category is any other behavior. This is what we call preparatory acts. Any other behavior beyond a verbal, a verbalization, by the way, is not a behavior, but any other behavior with suicidal intent, collecting or buying pills, purchasing a gun, writing a will or suicide note. So the question is, have you taken any steps towards making a suicide attempt or preparing to kill yourself, such as collecting pills, getting a gun, giving valuables away, or writing a suicide note? So the very examples are in the question for you to ask the subject or person. Now, remember I said the CDC definitions are the Columbia definitions. So this comes from a slide from the CDC information. And you can see that, that all of them you know, reference, reference the CSSRS, our, our work in definitions. And that's really good news because we're all beginning to speak the same language. And this is also from the new CDC document. And these are the unacceptable terms, the terms that we shouldn't be using anymore. And you see gesture, threat. These are terms you see thrown around in lots of different places. So we think now we're being moved towards a more meaningful common language, which hopefully will be uh, very beneficial. Now for behavior, you want to indicate everything that should be reflected but you only want to select something if it's a discrete behavior. So if somebody wrote a suicide note as part of an actual attempt, you wouldn't check off preparatory behavior and actual attempt because it was part of the actual attempt and you don't want to overcount things. Same thing, if there was a thought that was part of a, an attempt, you don't, you don't check both if it was clearly only part of the attempt because you don't want somebody to look more suicidal than they are. So this is the attempt section. And if you do the whole scale, it's just one page back front. And the attempt section is the only one with multiple questions. And I just want to highlight uh, two things. Remember I said you don't have to ask any or all questions, just what you need. Look at that last indented question. Or did you think it was possible you could have died from? Well, remember, if they deny intent, you can infer it if they thought it could have killed you. So if they deny intent, you're going to need that question. So it gives you the tools you may need to get to the right answer. M the majority of the time, they're going to give you the information. You're never going to get to that question. But if you need it, it's there. It's a very clear algorithm. If they said they did it because they wanted to die, then you're done. You get the yes. Okay, but if, if they don't, then you have that so you know whether it can be inferred, A plus B equals C. The other thing that's important here is, has subject engaged in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior? Why that's important is for two reasons. First of all, it gives you credit for having appropriately assessed something and ruling it out. If that weren't there for the self-mutilation cases, et cetera, it would just be nose down the page. It wouldn't be reflected that the right questions were asked and you decided that something shouldn't be called suicidal. It's also an important thing to, to know about. Lethality. We answer one lethality question for actual attempts. And if there is any medical damage of any sort, we answer it in terms of what actually happened in terms of medical damage. Not what could have happened or should have happened, but what actually happened so if there is medical damage, this is the question you'd answer. It's a zero through five. This is a compilation of the Beck medical lethality rating scale. Zero is no physical damage or very minor physical damage, e.g. surface scratches. So even a scratch can be a zero. A four is severe physical damage, medical hospitalization, because we're talking about medical damage here, not psychiatric. But to circle the right answer, you need to ask one or two open-ended questions if you don't already have the information. So for example, if they cut 
Did it require a Band-Aid or a bandage? Did it bleed a little or profusely? Again, just to be able to circle the right answer. Now, if there is no medical damage, like the gun that failed to fire, you, you answer one question about potential lethality. Another example where we would do that would be if somebody laid on the train tracks with an oncoming train, but they were pulled away before they were run over. As soon as that person laid on those train tracks, by the way, that became an actual attempt, and both of those would be a two, behavior likely to result in death despite available medical care. Because if they had been run over by the train or the gun had not failed to fire, likely they would have died no matter what. Now on the form, it says, if yes, please describe. What's the most important thing to write there or in your note or chart? What did they do and why did they do it? The pieces of evidence of why you did or didn't call something suicidal. You always want to make sure to assess ideation and behavior independently. Don't assume if they deny ideation that they won't have behavior. There are actually people who tell you they've never had a suicidal thought in their whole life that will tell you they've made attempts because they don't make the connection. So even if they say, no, I've never had a thought, you have to ask about behaviors. Now, the assessment periods or time frames are flexible or amenable to whatever the study or clinical need is. So the first time you do it, there's a, you get a baseline or a lifetime history and then a more recent. Um, it's used for screening. It's act, there's actually, in, in ongoing trials and settings, there's something called an already enrolled subjects version because some good data is better than no good data, so it's very often put in the middle of, of ongoing studies or settings. And then the way that works is if somebody gets it four months into a, into a trial, they get asked, how many attempts did you make before starting this study, and how about from the study start till now? Now, the first time you do this in research or clinical practice, we're, we're getting a lifetime time frame. For behavior, it's very straightforward. We capture all lifetime occurrences, the total number of attempts ever, et cetera. But for ideation, we treat it a little bit differently. The time frame, the first time you do this, is the time they were feeling the most suicidal. The time in your life you were feeling the most suicidal, did you wish you were dead, et cetera. The reason is that the research has shown this to be the most clinically meaningful. People often assume it's, it's recent, but actually Beck's work has shown that the most suicidal time, even if it was 20 years ago, is much more predictive than, of suicide than, than recent. So we need to ask about that most suicidal time the first time. So this, for example, is, is the, a version that people would use very often the first time. You get the lifetime and then you get recent. Typically in practice, what we recommend and people use is the past month for ideation and the past three months for behavior, but that can be anything. That column can be past seven days or whatever the particular study or setting wants to make it. And this is what's used in research. So you get a baseline and then there's a screening column. And the screening column just operationalizes the exclusion criteria past X months, depending on whatever those criteria are. And then every time a patient or a subject or a person is followed after that, the since last visit version is done, which captures all events and types of thoughts since the last assessment. Since I last saw you, have you done anything or had thoughts of? Whether that's six days or six months. Okay, a few more case examples. The patient stated she experienced heartbreak over the loss of a guy she took four clonazepam, called a girlfriend, and talked or cried it out. She was dismissive of its seriousness, but indicated she wanted to die at the time she took the overdose. What would we call that? An attempt, interrupted, or aborted? Four pills with some intent. An attempt. Attempt, exactly. As soon as she took that first pill or swallowed it. During pill count, the study staff discovered that six tablets were missing. Upon questioning, the patient admitted she was saving them up so she could take them all together at a later time in order to kill herself. Interrupted, aborted, or preparatory? Preparatory. Preparatory, exactly. That's the very example, collecting pills. The patient reported he first started thinking about killing himself when he was 12, he thought about how easy it would be to pretend to fall in front of a bus before it was able to stop, 
so that it would look like an accident. Although we thought about it often, he said he didn't have the courage to do it. Now, what would that be? Preparatory ideation with a plan or ideation with a method? Ideation with a method. Because this isn't a plan yet. A plan would be more formulated, more detailed. A plan is next Tuesday at 3 o'clock, I'm going to go into my husband's medicine cabinet when I know he's going to be away at the office so he can't come home to stop me. A plan is what, where, when, and how. So he thought about the bus, but it was not as formulated as a plan. Now, People assume that when you start to ask every subject or patient or person uh, these questions that it's going to actually increase burden, but the data is showing us the opposite. So starting with, you know, this, this, there's something called the PHQ-9, which is Dr. Spitzer who developed the DSM. It's his wonderful scale developed in primary care for symptoms of depression. But the suicide item says thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself in some way. First of all, we don't consider better off dead anything, not even passive suicidal ideation. And again, we as NIMH and Beck's group in Columbia have a working group on definitions. The only thing that's ever been evidence supported is a wish to die. Beck's work has shown if you have a wish to die, you're five to six times more likely to end your life, Beck and Brown. So already you set yourself up for false positives because that shouldn't be anything in suicidal ideation. Hurting yourself can be self-mutilation, suicidal behavior, again, false positives. And we have many settings where that item is followed by the CSSRS, and that's what we see. When you ask the right questions, you do away with cases that should have never been called suicidal in the first place. In addition, you'd miss every type of ideation that you need and behavior, the number one risk factor. This is why some National Guards and Cleveland Clinic, et cetera, are moving from that item to the CSSRS because we can't afford to do either one of those things. Now, this is 14,000 um, obesity patients. And when they relied on spontaneously generated adverse events using the PHQ-9, they got 452 occurrences. When they moved to asking the questions across groups systematically, the right questions, we think, they got 12. Very poignant example of how doing this in a better way is actually reducing unnecessary burden. There's a lot of clinical lore in the field that asking these questions is going to cause somebody to be suicidal, but the data actually says the opposite. Dr. Gould, who's an author on the CSSRS, has a seminal article in JAMA 2005 indicating that it doesn't cause distress or, or suicidal issues. Actually, there was a recent um, study done um, with, I don't know, a thousand investigators or sites, and the overwhelming majority actually said that doing this was easy to incorporate, has improved patient safety, and is beneficial. So the feasibility has has been great. You do not need to have uh, mental health training to administer the scale. We've trained hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of nurses and coordinators across the world with good feasibility. And actually at Reading Hospital, when we did it for the JACO requirement, we trained 812 nurses and got 99% reliability, independent of mental health training, even independent of education, because there were a whole bunch of high school degrees in there. It's been used a few million times, uh, likely, or more, across all phases of development, all types of interventions. It's available in 103 languages. Um, and it's used for not just for safety, because if interventions work, suicidal issues can be reduced. So it's really nice to have something to do- evidence that. So it's used for benefit and outcome frequently as well. And as I mentioned, to establish inclusion-exclusion criteria. Because it used to be in the past in clinical trials, it used to say serious risk, bad risk, and and nobody knew what the heck that meant. So it's actually helping to operationalize what that means. And in clinical and institutional settings, you know, hospitals to jails, um, fire departments, et cetera, it's used for for safety, for um, improvement and worsening and and collecting epidemiological data, as a component of a suicide risk assessment for screening, um, et cetera. And this shows you where it's been used, um, not just across all of psychiatry, but pretty much across every non-psychiatric um, medical disorder that you can imagine from, from eczema to Alzheimer's and, you know, TBI and, and, and OEF, OIF, you know, military, et cetera. And this, 
actually shows you the kind of clinical and international use or requests for use. Um, JACO best practices, World Health Organization, used in the Army, National Guard, um, Japanese National Institute of Mental Health and Neurology, Israeli Defense Force, um, hospitals, inpatients, outpatients, emergency, emergency departments, general medical and psychiatric, drug and alcohol addiction centers, fire departments, police departments, judges and states to help reduce unnecessary hospitalizations, um, et cetera, except prisons. I mean, I could go on and on. But to us, this is the very, very good news because this does reflect, hopefully, that we're all beginning to speak a, a common language. It also reflects, I think, the, the great need that had been out there to do something like this. And um, ultimately, that will all help us prevent lots and lots of use in the military, lots and lots of of studies and a myriad of, of disorders in the military. The large uh, army study, uh, Army STARS was using it, and many, many, many clinical sites across the military, many, many multi-site national trials and international agencies have, have asked for it. It's also finally uh, tailored for population-specific data collection, so things can be added on depending on what the particular questions are. So, for example, in epilepsy, there's something called the post-ictal phenomenon, and people want to know sometimes if the suicide, suicidal issues occurred during that phase. So here we add a column so that can be indicated. In Huntington's disease, stage of disease is an important risk factor, so we add an item there. There's a pediatric cognitively impaired version that adds additional probes that, you know, very young children or impaired people might need. There was a suicide cluster up in, in New York, and it was a different demographic, African-American females, and it was a gang-related precipitant. And there, New York State, you know, we trained the police in the schools, or the, and, and New York State wanted to know if the subsequent Suicide, suicidal ideation and behavior we were assessing were related to that precipitant. So we added a, a few questions to assess that. And the final example is in the military. We add a few additional questions. Legal troubles, financial troubles, state of service, particular risk factors that are associated with that population. And this was the screening version that they, that they used at Reading. So on that note, I will stop, and this is my email. I really, really welcome any questions you have on how to give the scale, what to call something. We have a website that has lots of information, and I uh, thank you for your, your time and attention.